Morning all, let's have a look at an interesting game in round 9, Magnus Carlsen who's having a fantastic tournament at Tatar still. Uh, he was playing against the French player Owen Lamy, Lamy the friend in French. Uh, so e4 from Magnus, c6, the Korokan, rock solid reputation, is it going to be a good idea against Magnus Carlsen? d4, d5, and we see knight d2. Doesn't matter sometimes if the knight goes to d2 or c3, if black's next move is d takes e4. Knight takes e4. Bishop f5, it's classical Karakhan territory. Knight g3, bishop g6. Okay, now maybe uh, slightly uh, less common than I think knight f3 and h4 for h5 is is a very common idea here uh, for, to encourage black to play h6 and then you can play h5 and bishop d3 but here Magnus actually doesn't touch this bishop with the h pawn instead he's going to try and uh, attack this bishop with pieces as we're going to see pretty soon his move here is bishop c4 okay black plays e6 so we have the bishop outside of the pawn chain a kind of upgrade to a French defence you might think that it's still quite solid for black. Uh, the nature of this position, black's pieces occupy the first three ranks often in the Karakhan classical, accepting uh, a kind of squash position, squash but solid position. But this knight 1e2 shows the idea that the bishop can be harassed with pieces instead of the h-pawn here. And if that occurs it slightly weakens um, black's structure Black wouldn't obviously want to take with the f pawn after knight takes g6, take, take with the um, h pawn, but um, that might be unpleasant for black uh, to lose that light square bishop here. And this next move um, has, has some issues with it uh, in the long term. This next move black plays is b5. Okay, you might think this is slightly odd because Black hasn't um, developed these two guys. It would be very interesting to do a reference check of this position to see how exactly theoretical it is. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's not too many games uh, in this position at the moment. After, after b5, it looks, it looks a little bit surprising for Black, even at move 7. So, um, Bishop b3, we see Black's in indication now to stop this knight f4 uh, with bishop d6 <laughs> with a simple idea uh, to eliminate this knight and give up the dark square bishop and positionally from a fundamental positional perspective um, you know if we didn't have to worry about tactics and details of position this looks kind of anti-positional what happens here knight f4 bishop takes f4 and the reason uh, I would say it's anti-positional is you know look at all these pawns on light squares and the corresponding dark square weaknesses in black's position black's given up the dark square defender basically and has got lots of dark square weaknesses and you can imagine in, in particular uh, that uh, you know c5 and e5 are close to the center uh, so these are two strategic squares which Magnus would like to occupy or make use of later perhaps um, okay, on the bright side of b5, it's as though c4 is discouraged because why would white want an isolated queen's pawn, right? So, how would access actually be given to c6 on the c file? You'd think that c4 is kind of discouraged if there's one perk uh, to playing b5, and that maybe black can look forward to using this d5 square to help justify this kind of paradox of kind of giving up a little bit on the dark squares here just to uh, keep this bishop on g6. And you could you could say black has no bad bishop or anything, and the knights are going to be good later. So are black's prospects uh, good or not? But well, we'll see. Knight f6 here, and now both sides castle. Okay, so the first interesting and you might say controversial decision here um, is th this use of black of the d5 square. I mean it's going to happen anyway unless white wants to give up the light square bishop or try and evict a knight later. That could be a useful square for black given this b5 pawn. 
But as I mentioned, if you play c4, you're going to end up with a nice take queen's pawn. That's actually exactly what Magnus plays here. Uh, so there's ups and downs in, in chess, and you've got to factor everything in. And it's very difficult sometimes. This th this next move, okay, we get an isolated queen's pawn, but we get frontal pressure on c6 later. We can make more use of the c5 square. Th this is already a trump card, which is not going to go away. This dark square bishop with weakened dark squares. So, you know, it provides access points, and maybe this, this c6 pawn is going to be a problem later with this frontal attack made available later, opening up. The problem is, yes, the isolated queen spawn, is that going to be an issue? The classic thing would be to blockade and maybe later try and destroy the isolated queen spawn or just try and um, reduce white's counterplay generally. Is that really going to happen here, though? Black does take, so we get this isolated queen spawn, the IQP for short. Okay, is it going to be a problem? Queen b6, hitting b2, keeping some pressure on d4, so maybe to uh, play rook d8 later, or use the blockade soon. We see queen d2, and in fact, rook d8. Okay, now e5 is held at bay with bishop f4, but c5 might be useful to black as well with this, this queen sitting um, on the same files the rook so we see rook fd1 here for the moment black is not that keen uh, to play c5 in this position it might not even actually work because of d takes c anyway rook takes d2 c takes b it might not work at all in this position c5 so c5 and e5 seem totally out of the question at the moment the blockade opportunity is it effective to play knight d5 it looks kind of comfortable in one respect, and that's something to check out maybe in, in the second pass of this game. In this position. Knight bd7 is played though in this position, which has a kind of weakness that the d6 square is not controlled here. It's blocking that control of d6. And so if black wanted to have played knight d5 just then, it would have been without bishop d6. But now we see after rook ac1, curiously knight d5 is played now, and of course the d6 square can be made use of and is made use of with bishop d6. So what is happening at the moment? This dark square bishop is kind of being celebrated in the position. c5 is locked down, e5 is locked down. The isolated queen's pawn, as far as being attacked with greater pressure, that's not happening for, for the moment. Knight 7 to f6, and the bishop goes to c5 comfortable parking spot Queen b8 okay and it looks as though here isn't black's position solid this nice solid blockade of the isolated Queen's pawn what has white got to show here well okay Magnus's next move is quite curious maybe just taking away some squares and not minding about any potential weaknesses on the diagonal here he's got the dark square bishop Anyway, this is a dark square diagonal, so maybe it's afforded by the position to play f3 just to lock out these squares like f, like e4 and g4, which could have been useful for black. And of course, there's also the f4 square is eyed by the knight and queen at the moment. Okay, we see the move h6, and actually this f4 square is worked on later, knight e2. So Magnus's last two moves are addressing these two squares. So what's happening though? What active plan will he will he use or not? Will he just be uh, strengthening his position a little bit more? Knight d7. Okay, he wants to preserve that dark square. Bishop puts it on a3. And now actually we do get a central break with e5, which comes at some expense really. That actually this d5 knight is a little bit more vulnerable frontally on d takes e5 uh, potentially. But uh, it doesn't have to be used right now. In fact, Magnus's next move is the very calm looking b3. Okay, b3, curious, because now bishop b2 is another possibility, and this bishop could be useful putting pressure down that diagonal. Okay, we see the move queen b6, trying to exploit this diagonal, which was weakened by f3. 
and this simply plays knight c3. So he's putting pressure on that d5 knight, the solidity of which was reduced a bit with e5. Okay, it's reinforced now by the other knight. And now this bishop goes back to that c5 square, queen c7. And now Magnus is not afraid of his queen being exposed or anything. There's no problem here with d takes e5. Queen takes e5. Now we see bishop d4. Okay, the bishops look nice and central. There's an isolated pawn here on a semi open file to potentially target soon. Uh, this pressure on d5 looks as though black's holding up d5 for the moment. Queen e7, and the queen's kicked again with rook e1, queen d6. Okay, and now we see the move queen f2, which gives possibilities like bishop c5. Black plays the forcing with knight takes c3. Bishop's got to get out of the way, otherwise queen d4. So bishop takes c3. Okay. Isn't it okay for black? Knight d5. White's still got this bishop pair. And what's really happened so far in the story of this game? White's just basically got rid of the isolated queen spawn. Has black's e5 really benefited black? Aren't the bishops uh, more effective because the center has been made open? No pawns on these four squares here. So the bishops are running more rampant than usual, aren't they? Than before. So it looks as though maybe White's got a little bit more of whatever he had before with this dark square bishop in particular. And it uses that lovely central square e5 now with tempo. So queen a3. Okay, what is the effective use of the bishop? We can say it's a trump card. But as, as in all like classic games like the Morphe versus the Duo, which we saw recently on this channel, um, it's nice having a particular bishop where the opponent hasn't got a bishop on that colour. And it's very nice if you can get attacking squares around the opponent's king. And g7 here strikes uh, the requirement uh, nicely to target for white in this position. And this next move looks kind of attacking in some respects. Magnus plays h4. And you can imagine, for example, queen g3, and we got this attack going on h5 soon with h5 as an imminent threat. So the threats maybe are kind of building up here to concern black. This this bishop would be pinned with queen g3. And you might think, well, if queen g3 is so strong, why did actually Magnus play h4 here and not queen g3? Isn't queen g3 a good move even in this position? That's interesting. Um, maybe a2 is a little bit of a problem. There's no rush to lose a2. If there's any point behind queen a3, it looks as though it's trying to tie this queen down. Um, and then possibly uh, black would have time for f6 to kind of celebrate his ill-gotten gains there, winning this a2 pawn. But no, Mengus' next move is karma. You know, h4 reserving queen g3 as a possibility soon. And it's here that... Uh, Black decides to do a kind of controversial pawn move, f6, because it slightly weakens this diagonal. The knight's now actually officially pinned to the king. Okay, and this dark square bishop is having a good time on these central squares now, bishop d4. Okay, this is quite dangerous looking, because now also there's a loose piece on g6. Another tempo gain, a queen g3 looks to be really threatened now in this position. So black protects that bishop, so queen g3 is not an immediate threat. And here we still see dangers on the dark squares uh, vividly with a very, very simple forcing move, white relinquishing the bishop pair just to play bishop takes d5 here. And clearly c takes d5, rook c7, even without any engine checking, looks pretty horrible for black because rook c7 would be threatening bishop takes f6. And a rook on the 7th is generally uh, quite dangerous. It can also be followed with rook e7 and queen g3 and h5 and everything seems to be pointing on f6 and g7 all of a sudden. So this might explain now why white is actually going material up because black plays in this position. Rook takes d5. He's saving himself a tempo for that rook, not immediately coming to c7. 
e7 is, is guarded right now anyway the queen's on c1 as well so but rook there's a free pawn here and it is taken black might think opposite color bishops but as we as we know when when in attacking scenarios often the opposite color bishops favor the attacker is this slightly different we see queen b4 double attack is this dangerous how is it going to be defended this double attack well this this rook's already defended so Magnus simply attacks the queen and defends d4 not a problem queen d6 and now attacking the queen again queen d8 okay king h2 so it looks as though queen g3 is going to happen pretty soon now isn't the time ripe for queen g3 or is the queen uh, wanted on this diagonal and in fact is the queen cheekily threatening to help the bishop win the pawn here even this next move gives gives a clue that maybe you know black is concerned about that as well uh, slightly getting getting the pawn off this bishop color so we see now bishop e7 okay bishop e7 what is the point of this move you might ask well it does set up some forcing move possibilities like bishop f6 maybe later especially after queen g3 bishop f6 rook c7 uh, this bishop will be endangered if the king's forced away from the bishop then queen g6 after we see queen b8 check though and the queen's coming off which may be some sort of relief to black that is at least not going to get mated uh, anytime soon so an exchange of queens magnus will pawn up opposite color bishop scenario does the initiative really emphasize the dark square bishop over the light square bishop here we see rook a7 okay rook c6 what does this actually threaten after a5 now we see bishop c5 hitting the rook the rook goes to d7 bishop e3 keeping black out of d2 here rook 7 to d6 rook c4 is black doing okay rook e6 king comes back to f2 white's pretty solid here can he really make use of this extra pawn rook d e5 we see rook c3 bishop e8 now bishop d3 offering exchange of rooks a4 and now Magnus takes off a pair of rooks and plays b4 and you might think well this two to one pawn majority here isn't it blockadable on the light squares bishop b5 makes that kind of statement as well as threatening rook e2 check that's prevented with bishop e3 and it looks as though uh, black could potentially also be unblockaded with rook c5 here black is not too concerned it seems black plays h5 not too concerned about rook c5 and in fact we see rook c7 another way of attacking this bishop or putting pressure on the position might be back on g7 with bishop d4 putting pressure on the diagonal we see king g6 rook a7 okay can white really win this against the very strong grandmaster this position isn't the worst over for black opposite colored bishops the two to one pawn majority doesn't seem as though it's such a big deal black's king safety seems fine g4 seems sort of wobbly as well it's not going to be a g4 break so let's see what happens here rook d5 okay now magnus just plays king g3 is it going to be a draw is magnus going to be held to a draw here rook d3 isn't this a2 also a potential problem if black plays like rook a3 can he not attack a2 in this position soon bishop c5 and we do see rook a3 what's going on here there's a slight problem hold on a sec uh oh with Magnus's last move bishop c5 that was not so innocent as it seemed the bishop has possibility of bishop f8 on g7 
Why didn't Black do something about that, you might ask? If Black plays too passively, though, there's a problem here with the Rook on a7. If Rook d8, then maybe Rook a5. And trying to play for b5 later could be unpleasant. So it seems this is this is getting uh, to be a sharper position now. Rook a3 invites, positively invites, the seemingly dangerous bishop f8. Black's banking on this a pawn, and maybe this this light square bishop is going to be useful for guiding the a pawn down the board. Okay, rook takes a2, and a very interesting move now. Reducing counterplay of the opponent's king, believe it or not, and maybe a stunning move in some respects. What would you play here? You've just lost a key pawn, so material has just been equalized completely. Opposite colored bishops, what would you play in this position if I gave you 10 seconds starting from now? Okay, Magnus plays King F4, making the fret Rook takes G7 very, very effective. That King is deprived of the F5 square. <coughs> Pardon me. So we see King H7, Rook takes G7, and the King has to go back to H8. As in many Magnus games we've seen in this tournament, this his King is often better than the opponent's King. It's no different here. And he's still a pawn up here. And the rook is now protecting g2 from there. And he's improving his king with king f5, threatening king f6, king takes f6. So he's going to be a pawn up again. But what about this a pawn? Isn't it a concern? Doesn't, have to, this, doesn't this have to be precisely calculated? Isn't it too much to have this cake and still eat it? to win this f6 pawn and not lose to a passed a pawn here. Rook c2, king takes f6, Magnus thinks he can do it. a3, he can get behind the pawn now. It goes to a2, which might frighten many of us. OK. For the moment, no problem. Uh, black needs two moves. To so say bishop c4, rook c1, a1, needs a few moves anyway. For the moment, safeguard the g2 pawn. There's still time to safeguard that pawn. OK. And there's a very important aspect to this as well, that actually it's unfortunate that the king is on the same colour as the bishop, because even a tempo gaining check and blocking uh, might fell to something like king f7 and bishop g7 check to save Queen, uh, well, to prevent the Queen here. So we see off the check, we see actually not not actually King F7. That might not be uh, playable here, but um, we see instead King G5 because actually the Rook can support the Bishop on G7 here. So on Rook A6 we can have Bishop G7 check, taking, and then the bishop can stop the queen. Unfortunate for black. So Mangus has ha had his cake and he's eating it quite happily right now of, of winning the material on the king side. Three to one on the king side, pass pawn here just, just, just to boot. And he's also stopping this a pawn. Unfortunately, it has been precisely calculated. This a pawn's going nowhere at the moment, it seems. Black didn't even, white didn't even need king f7. It, it, it wouldn't have helped. So king g5, just the bishops, enough to be supported by the rook on a7 here. Maybe black's a bit annoyed by this, accepting the inevitable maybe by now. King, king g8. And the bishop can even just, doesn't have to use g7 at all, can use d4 if it wants to keep an eye on a1. So bishop c5, if ever any rook a6, just taking bishop d4. And this is hopeless on the king's side. Blank now interrupts 
the a pawn being locked down from the rook with bishop a6 but now bishop d4 okay we see rook d6 now we just see uh, bishop a1 and black thinks it's pretty pretty helpless here it's it's resignable now apparently because black actually resigned let's see any efforts to do something with this pawn it looks futile but um, here black resigned uh, let's let's look at this game and this position and work backwards after from the start okay so what can we observe initially at depth 17 it doesn't seem like a big deal what is going on here forget these engine alternatives for the moment like rook d5 let's just imagine the normal looking rook d1 it doesn't help does it we even have the option of even taking on a6 here I personally would have thought bishop f6 is also um, no bishop f6 is unplayable because because black can just just maybe queen here or is it seems this is an advantage as well um, even this continuation is is okay because we have I think b5 here and that'll be enough material rook a5 this is fine uh, for white this is winning for white as well even this continuation but okay the most uh, critical the most clinical rather in this position white can apparently just take on a6 or throw in a check first then take on a6 so let's take on a6 rook takes a1 the king is shielded from the checks here and the rooks kind of stuck therefore after king takes h5 if the rook ever moves rook takes a2 uh, if black doesn't want to lose a2 then this b pawns just queening so that's just totally hopeless so rook d1 is totally hopeless and what of this other engine move what is this about this rook d5 why would that possibly help okay well for those interested in uh, technical nitty-gritty let's have a look at king f4 which is apparently an inferior idea bishop c4 keeping hold of that and now it seems to be there's, there's potentially some sort of threat although I, had, I have difficulty seeing it after rook d1 because the bishop would just move um, let, let's see let's give for example g4 taking and then playing rook d1 and the bishop moves and so what the pawn's going nowhere still okay rook b1 what if black can get this pawn okay uh, let's go with h5 rook takes b4 h6 isn't aren't these pawns just winning now or can black do something on these light squares check rook b5 it looks ultimately as though these two pawns should outweigh this a pawn here or is it tricky because we do have a light square blockade evolving here and this kind of position looks tricky in this scenario we've got to be very careful sometimes the opposite color bishops can help for blockades um, which are unblockadable now if we go back actually this could all be avoided though apparently there's a there's a more technical uh, continuation here uh, in this position of the rook we, we gave um, bishop f6 pardon me of the rook d1 rook d5 check in this position white does better to go to f6 so let's put the king on f6 here and try and avoid any potential blockades so what would be happening here bishop c4 why is this an improvement well the king might it looks as though the king's helping for potential mating nets check or is it just helping the pawns f4 
Okay, here, this is interesting. Let's go with this check. And if king g8, let's go with f5. And give an example of taking here. Why is this a problem? Check. King g5. It looks as though rook a7 or f6 are strong now. For example, bishop g8. Check. And this bishop and rook, well, that's hopeless. Black's giving up a bishop there. And if black does something else, it's pretty hopeless because of uh, rook a7, surely. Oh, rook h8 is mate. So the king is, is helping for mating that, so it's keeping the king out of certain squares. So if we go back here, yeah, this does look pretty pretty bad. If if Magnus's king is going forward rather than back there, that, that's more logical. Okay, so ultimately it looks it looks pretty hopeless, uh, this position. Uh the opposite colour bishops are not particularly uh saving black it seems ultimately if if white plays uh carefully. So rook d5 check, the king can go in to f6. And you might think, well, what about what about check? Where would the king actually go here? Goes to e7. In this position, well, the bishop's loose. That's the problem. Uh, if rook b6, f4, it looks pretty hopeless. The king is also guiding the f-pawn down the board here. So it's very, very useful. Bishop c4, f5. Gets to play f6. That's quite good. Also, b5 is apparently very good here as well. If b5, that's an overload on black's position. If rook takes b5, then this is a mate in three because uh, black's getting mated with this. This f pawn is now holding up g6. So rook h8. Okay, I think we're convinced. We can be convinced this final position was was completely lost uh, with good play. So let's let's go back and uh, to the opening, and just out of interest, do a reference check. This looks like an unusual continuation, actually. Bishop c4 already uh, instead of knight f3. Uh, so let's see. So I'm running a reference check on this opening now. Knight f3 or h4 are the two most popular moves so far. H4, nine thousand, no, eleven thousand, and it settled down. Nearly 12,000 games. I've got h4, knight f3, 8,000. Bishop c4, we're talking 1,577. Kasparov, Svidla, Morozovic have played it all before. Okay, so it's nothing too special. Okay, e6, top move played, logical. Knight 1 to e2, is that more unusual? No, that's the standard move in this position. It's the standard idea then. 11. 1156 games because Boris Fidler Morozovich continued with knight 1 to e2. Now b5, is that really the standard move here? I was surprised by it. I would have I found it can't be, cannot be a trodden path, can it? b5, surely not. And lo and behold, in this position, b5 seems pretty, pretty unusual. Only one game and the best uh Elo was 1846 with the move B5 before. Uh, for those interested, if I click on that, that was Savitsky, Savitsky against Gudvansky, who was 1846 against a 2143 playing white and the 2143 won. Um, it looks like a very strange opening move to play B5 here. The most common move is bishop d6, 608 games. Alan Topolov, Barrier, Drev all play bishop d6 here. Second popular is knight f6, 419 games. Alan, Liko, Drev, Barrier. Knight bd7 is 45 games. We go down to 45 after that. So these are the two top moves. So b5, interesting. Bishop b3, there's no real reference games here. Apart from that, that one game with an 1846 playing c5 here, and then that was reacted to with c3. But uh, no, we're out of book. We're out of book here. Just at move eight, believe it or not. And it looks as though White's picked up um, an advantage by move ten. White's got the bishop pair, dark square bishop. 
uh, which can celebrate all the dark squares, the central squares in particular, and later it was G7 celebrating around Black's King. Okay, we've got a slightly controversial looking decision C4 here. The engine likes A4 or H4, so C4. Did we see an evaluation drop? Yes. Uh, so knight d5 or queen b6, queen b6, we're looking at a position that looks about equal here. So Magnus doesn't mind the isolated queen's pawn in this scenario. He's got a, a small plus, but uh, it's no big deal, it seems, at this point. Uh, he keeps more tension than the engine would here. He doesn't take on d5, he just plays bishop d6. Well, at this, at this depth anyway, bishop d6, keep more tension in the game. Kicks the queen. So we see the move f3, which also looks as though, is that is that really necessary? What was actually black threatening? If we gave black an extra move, black's not really threatening much here, in fact. So I'm not entirely sure. f3, okay, I mean, was knight e4 a threat in simplification, for example? Possibly knight e4. It's avoided anyway. It looks as though knight e4 has been avoided. It might help simplify the position. So f3 just keeping black out of e4 and g4. Okay, knight e2. Is is white actually threatening anything with knight e2? Okay, maybe knight c3 and just get rid of this blockade. Bishop drops back here, and we see the move. E5. Now I suspect this is slightly weakening to black on this diagonal intuitively. Would we see an evaluation uh, increase after E5? Yes. Why did, why did black want to lose the solidity of his support for the D5 square? Is it the case that knight C3 is such a problem? If white was given an extra move or two, It doesn't look as though there's anything major here. So e5, and we see the move b3, which is really, really light from an engine point of view. b3, and also bishop d5 is, is, is good. So what does actually b3 uh, do? Is black threatening anything in this position of great interest? It doesn't seem like it. B3 does give like an opportunity maybe for Bishop B2 at some point. Bishop B2 at some point. Just just looking at that diagonal and looking at G7, starting to look at G7. Okay, so Queen B6, Knight C3. It looks as though it's a pleasant advantage for White. Kick the Queen off the diagonal, and now this is the time to take on E5 here, the most effective time. Kick the queen again. So white's dissolved the isolated queen's pawn and has that lovely bishop pair. Both bishops on nice central squares. Queen f2. It looks like a nifty move, queen f2, and it's, it's light from an engine point of view, queen f2. Eyeing c5. Black now takes on c3. So white's got a significant advantage here. It's, it's something to almost write home about now. Significant positional advantage. Uh, with the centre opened up like this, the bishops are more effective, going straight across that centre. Knight d5, bishop e5, okay, queen b, queen a3. And um, okay, there's, there's, there's some problems, it seems, for black to do with g7 on the horizon here. This next move, h4 isn't mentioned at this at this moment from an engine point of view. F4 is, is mentioned, uh, which looks dangerous for potentially F5 taking an F6. Uh, Magnus's move is also pretty good as well. He's keeping pressure on the king side. Bishop drops back. And now I'm pretty sure we've got the threat of Queen G3 at some point. Bishop takes and rook c7 is the, is the more critical one at the moment. Okay, so we see king h7, and now white takes on d5. 
kind of cashing out his position in this exchange, this uh, quite committal exchange. So rook takes c6. If black had played c takes d5, let's just check intuitively that rook c7 is pretty strong. Rook c7 is, is pretty strong, but also h5 here immediately is, is a pretty dangerous forcing move as a pawn sack. That accelerates queen g3 or something. Let's just check this. So if, if it takes here, intriguing, intriguing, then actually queen h4 looks strong in this position, bishop f7. If the bishop went back to g6, rook c7, fret, bishop f6 or queen f6. So also rook takes g7 is now threatened for queen takes f6 check. That would be crushing. So let's go with, let's go with queen, say queen f8. Bishop takes f6, it's devastating on g7 here, this position. It looks absolutely devastating. And the queen is also protecting the rook here, so rook g7. It looks it looks horrible. So that's interesting. That actually h5 might be a very technical uh, threat on c takes d5 in this position. Move h5 very quick uh, for queen h4 for rook at c7. And these dark square pawns around the king uh, seem in grave danger for Black's king safety here after h5. If the bishop moves back to say f7, we go rook c7. Bishop c5 wins the exchange as well here, or nearly. Even stronger might be just doubling rooks here, and this looks pretty grim. In fact, in this position, bishop takes f6. What's going on here? Check now, and this looks crushing. Even stronger than rook f7 is queen f4 threatening uh, to mate black. Queen f4, and this this is just hopeless, isn't it? Uh, I think why can't we just take on h6 here? Isn't that simple? And king g8. Okay, rook takes f7 might even be stronger. Taking now. Queen g6. End of game. It, look, it looks horrendous then. So this h5 looks really strong. Whatever happens here. So black goes upon down. In this scenario, he's a pawn down now, uh, but uh, his king's much safer. So white uh, is having to grind black now a little bit. Opposite color bishops are pawn up. Is white actually threatening? Bishop takes a seven, a seven. Not it wasn't really a major threat. More more significant is queen g three. Okay, bishop e seven. If the king went back here, uh, would that be a big problem? Queen b5. Okay, so Magnus welcomes the exchange of queens anyway. Queen g3. And doesn't mind this position at all. Uh, try and grind black down. Okay, okay, so not quite a pawn up from an engine point of view, this position. It needs some grinding. Uh, black is threatening rook d2. So that's extinguished. Okay, we see rook e6. Rook c3. White's just carrying an advantage, it's not going anywhere. Black's trying to get a light square blockade and to prove that this 2 to 1 is not maybe that significant. And off the b4, that seems to be like it's falling into Black's uh, strategy of the light square blockade. But it's, is it liftable? That's the question. The rook is finding the ideal spot. A7. It's not only holding this pawn back; it's starting to threaten things like G7 soon, with White's uh, dark square bishop having this operation available after Rook C7. So first, stop the pawn um, and make way for Bishop C5 without Rook D2 check. That gives an extra move there. That was a nice little subtlety because if you know you don't want to lose a2 anyway to rook d2, so force black to work to get to that a2 pawn here. Uh, now going for the g7 pawn. 
So white seems to be advantageous all the way. This is the strongest move in the position rather than taking on g7. That is, this would be nothing, I think, for white. Absolutely nothing. So it means plays the absolutely needed move king f4 here to really make this more significant, more effective, taking on g7. King f5, very nice move. Okay, king takes f6. Get behind the pawn just in time. G3 is is good. Keeps the advantage. Now King F7. I think I mentioned that as probably an absolute blunder. Actually, isn't it? It's an absolute blunder. That'd be terrible to go there. Check. Check. <laughs> and this is not looking good. Uh, what is going on? There's a tactic here, so this is all avoided by Magnus. He'd, he'd lose the game. That'd be embarrassing. Black would queen, the dream come true. So one move slip like that would be a disaster. King has to go back. It's it's sufficient and good that White has Bishop G7 supported by the Rook. Doesn't need the King supporting Bishop G7. There's ways and means of managing this a pawn here. And this this seems to be the right way. And c5 is stopped by the pawn anyway. No no annoying checks. And it's on a dark square, so the intuitive comfort factor. Bishop hasn't got any nasty checks. The light square bishop on a dark square. King so fine. King g8. Bishop c5. The bishop's now got d4. Was there a more accurate move here? Maybe bishop g7 potentially. Does it matter? After bishop a6, bishop d4, rook d6. I mean, it was after bishop a1 that um, Owen uh, resigned here, and we saw some analysis from before on this position. What can we say? It's another masterpiece in, in many respects. Of um, It seemed b5 was a bit odd, though. It's it's going off the rails of opening for it, move 7. Uh, White seemed to have the comfortable bishop pair, but then Magnus. Seem to accept the isolated queen's pawn to give black something to do or blockade on d5. Uh, but then the dark square bishop really throughout the game had various implications in the center uh, and on g7 later. And uh, you know, a bit of a grind, but um, it makes it three wins in a row for Magnus. He can just convert these positions, it seems. No one's able to uh, avoid losing. Okay, comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.